Oh, hello, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about some anthropological investigation that have been going on in the north of Scotland over the past couple of years. Um, so anthropology is a very fancy term for charcoal analysis, basically. So it's the study and interpretation of wood charcoal, both from on-site um, sediments, so archaeological context, but also off-site sediments from pollen cores, from monolithins, et cetera. And there is a number of things that charcoal can tell us about the site. Uh, first of all, it can tell us about culturally determined choices in uh, uh, food fuel or uh, material for construction. So for example, the different the pre preference for green wood or for season wood, uh, smaller diameter or larger diameter timbers. It can also tell us about uh, the procurement strategies that they utilize to get the fuel of choice. Uh, this can include things like uh, silvicultural techniques that are aimed at maintaining a steady supply of fuel without necessarily uh, damaging the woodland. So, for example, coppicing or pollarding. Um, it, if we have a longer uh, sequence, so multiple phases on a site, then charcoal can also tell us about woodland succession following both environmental or human disturbances on the environment. And it can tell us about stand composition, so which species were in the canopy, which species in the understory, roughly um, the distribution. So was it a very large understory and just a few canopy species on the other way around? And of course, the availability of resources. So which kind of species were accessible, not just in the environment, um, it naturally growing around them, but also which species they managed to get from other places in the UK, for example, or abroad. So generally, this can be divided into two main contribution of charcoal. It's both paleoethnobotanically valuable, so it can tell us about people, and paleoenvironmental uh, in its value, so it can tell us about the environment. And anthropology in the Scottish Iron Age, but also in Scotland is, in general, is not very popular. It's mainly a continental Europe subject. It, it's been developed in France, and that, that's where it's most popular. It's over 150 years old, but it's still very limited in Scotland. And this is what Scarf said about it in 2012. So it's now 10 years, and the situation is pretty much the same. Um, identification is often focused on uh, samples for carbon-14 dating only. And so we end up with uh, data sets that are extremely limited, maybe five or six fragments identified from hundreds and hundreds of contexts. Um, and the reports, of course, are limited in their value for statistical or comparison purposes because there's just not enough for a statistically significant uh, interpretation. But the SCARF report also said that there is much more that charcoal can do for us. And so one of their recommendations was that there should be more studies uh, of charcoal that include morphology of fragment, ring curvature, uh, evidence of decay, like fungal hyphae or insect boreholes. And this is a review of publication that I've done as part of my undergrad and then updated as part of my master's studies um, of publication of Iron Age sites in Scotland. I've looked at both journals and monographs, but also grey literature that's available on the archaeological data service. And as we can see, so this is just a reference for where, in theory, people add the information available to them that charcoal can be a great, of great value. And the number of sites overall has increased quite significantly over the years. But the number of studies that have looked at charcoal beyond just identification is not even vaguely keeping up with the increase in publications. So hopefully today I'll be able to show you how charcoal can inform on woodland management, wood fuel selection, and canopy and stand composition using two case studies. The first is Codazzo. This is a huge purpose-made uh, craft working center located in the outskirts of Inverness. It's got a number of roundhouses that were used as workshop, and the site has yielded almost a quarter of old melting furnaces known for the Scottish Iron Age. And then we have the Cairns, which I assume most of you will be familiar with. And 
uh, its beautiful graph site, and it gives us an example of smaller scale. I, I'm, some say domestic, but I would say just smaller scale uh, metal working. So the methods that I use, I take fragments from bo both bulk and spot samples. And the first thing is taxonomic identification. So each fragment is broken to expose the three um, planes that allow for uh, identification. So transverse, radial, and longitudinal sections. So um, I can observe the anatomical features that are characteristic of, his, of each species. Then uh, I do recording of dendroecological features. I look, for example, at um, radial cracks. They're very, very faint, but radial cracks happen when um, when wood shrinks, so it loses moisture. It can happen; they can happen during seasoning, for example, but also during burning. And their number of development depends on the level of moisture contained in the in the fragment before carbonization. And I look at other things like scar tissues, um, insect boreholes, but I also measure. Um, growth ring, so to, have a, to see what pattern in growth is shown on each fragment. And then I apply some dendro eco uh, ecological techniques. So we have qualitative uh, estimation of ring curvature, which just uh, is a qualitative estimation of the diameter, the original caliber of the fragment. If the rings are uh, show very weak curvature, then this means that uh, the fragment likely came from a larger timber, probably from trunkwood. If they're moderately curved, then they're likely to originate from larger branches and strong curvature indicates the use of twigs or small branches. And on Caldato, I also used uh, quantitative methods of diameter estimation. Um, this is, the trigon trigonometrical technique that instead of using ring curvature, you use the angle between rays to estimate uh, the location of the of the missing pit. Uh, so the first case study is the Cairns. This is the landscape in which it's located. It's Winnook Bay looking towards the northeast. And that's the site over there. Um, the rock, of course, is the main feature on the site, but um, the metal working actually took place in the village, specifically in Structure K, that's over there, where there are two furnaces that were used in two different phases. Martin will correct me if I say anything <laughs> wrong. So this is Structure K. Um, it looks like it's a ruin, and it was a ruin back in the day when they were using it for metal working. And there's a number of things that came out of it. So we've got bronze objects, we've got metal working tools, got crucibles for non-ferrous metal working, and molds again for non-ferrous metal working, because in the Iron Age, they could not reach the temperature needed to smelt iron to the point where it was liquefied. So they couldn't just pour it into molds. That's why iron was also a very precious commodity, because it needed extra work to be put into the shape of a pin or a brooch. Okay, the first phase is connected to the use of um, uh, an iron an iron furnace. So they, they're, it's ferrous metal working at the first phase. And as you can see there, this is, it looks a bit like a, a pollen diagram. It's pretty much the same thing, but it's the charcoal. It's quite straightforward. They were using willow, almost exclusively willow. There is some older, which is the same material that they used for the, the bowl in the in the well. And very interestingly, they were using some Pythia abius, which is spruce, which is not native to Orkney and not native to the UK. So that is an indication of the use of driftwood that they were probably collecting from the beach and that likely came from places like Norway or potentially North, North America being carried by the, the North Sea. And in terms of caliber distribution, um, we see that they were clearly preferring smaller caliber wood and medium caliber. There is a little bit of weak curvature, but that's mainly associated with the spruce. So they were probably getting trunks um, as drift wood. And in the second phase, this is the, it's pretty much the same willow again, or poplar. It's quite difficult to distinguish between willow and poplar in charcoal. Um, 90, almost 99% of the assemblage 
In this phase, they're also doing non-ferrous metal working, so a lot of bronze working, and, and a little bit of older again. Same story with the caliber distribution. This is mainly small caliber. So this could potentially be indicative of management because they seem to prefer smaller caliber, and that is a more sustainable way of fuel procurement. And then there is Kaldafel. Kaldafel is located in the southern outskirts of Inverness. This is the city of Inverness looking towards the Dunkyle. On this side, there is Firth. On that side, the Moray Firth. And here, off, just off the picture, there is um, a glacial moraine. So there is a bit of an upland zone. And Kaldafel is located just at the bottom of the upland zone there. It doesn't look like it today, but unfortunately, it's just like a normal housing development. Um, there is a bit of everything coming out from Caldaso, and it's really beautiful. The site produced the largest later prehistoric uh, metalworking assemblage in Scotland. They're, they've got metal weapons, they've got metalworking tools for both ferrous and non-ferrous metalworking. Loads of glass beads, they were producing glass at the site. And, and personal and ornament as well. And on top of this, over 250 kilograms of slag. Um, this slag is mainly from smelting, but uh, the analysis of the slag has revealed that they were carrying out every step in the metalworking process pr from uh, roasting the ore to blacksmith um, into objects. And this is, uh, these are all the workshops from the metalworking phase at the site. But uh, in my studies, I focus on four, workshop 16, uh, workshop 12, 13, which uh, has got two furnaces because um, it was used over two different uh, stages and remodeled and workshop two. Um, the met the radiocarbon dating program was not excellent. So there is, very little resolution in the radiocarbon dates, but generally we can divide the structures into three main periods. There is an early metalwork phase in which probably two workshops were in use, maximum three. There is a peak metalworking phase where uh, of the nine metalworking furnaces, we've got probably five. But according to Dr. Gemma Cruikshank, who works for the National Museum of Scotland and is an expert in slag analysis. Um, what should I do? <laughs> um, there's, there's likely more furnaces than that active at the same time. So we're talking about a massive metalworking effort. Okay. And then we've got uh, a later metalworking phase. This is not working. Okay. Later metalworking phase in which we production goes down again and we're back to probably maybe a couple of workshops working at the same time. Workshop 16 sits very well in the early metalworking phase, so it will give us an idea of what was going on with the fuel procurement at that time. Then we have the first stage of workshop 13, followed by workshop 12, the second stage of workshop 13, which has a, an additional uh, furnace, and then workshop 2 in the later metal working phase. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Okay. Um, so we don't currently have any pollen record for the area of Caldasso and in Inverness as in general, there's very poor pollen of the available ones are not dated because they were done before the 70s. But charcoal from Caldasso, that's um, that's a summary of what of my findings from um, um, environmentally representative deposits, um, indicates that they probably had three types of rootland available to them. So the first one is a wet rootland of alder and, and willow, which was probably located along the banks of the Big Burn, which is a tributary of the, of the river Ness, just adjacent to the site. Then uh, a lowland mixed deciduous rootland where uh, oak and hazel are the dominant taxa. And then probably upland birch roots represented by some, some phases in which bachelor seems to be uh, increasing in use. Uh, 
And this is the modern uh, Vootland around Invernessshire, and that's Caldasso. And as we can see, they seem to have, have access in the Iron Age to the same types of Vootland that are available today. In the early episodes of metalworking, there we go, um, we see that the taxonomic variety in the record is pretty limited. Uh, older and hazel are the dominant taxa, with the hazel being almost, uh, well, yes, being being the dominant in the in the furnace. In the furnace, uh, there were there was just uh, older and hazel, so there were probably preferring the taxa, potentially selecting them specifically for the for the metalworking activity. And they were going for um, larger branches, so moderately curved food. In as metalworking uh, activity increased at the site, there is a change in um, in the composition of the assemblage, but there's also a change in the diameter caliber distribution. So there is an increased exploitation of wetland taxas, like willow and older. So they were likely shifting from the use of mainly lowland deciduous woodland to wetland woodland, which is rich in fast growing species that can that have a higher yield of, um, of wood in a shorter period of time, like alder and willow. And they're also shifting to much smaller diameter. So this could be due to potentially an overexploitation of certain resources during the earlier phase where they were felling um, felling lar uh, young trees potentially, but um, it could also be indicative of uh, a change in procurement strategy that included management of some kind. And this is supported by um, the single growth patterns of fragments. Uh, this is a fragment of older from one of the of the peak metalworking phase. And that is a fragment of hazel. Well, these are two fragments from early and very late metal working on site. So when the demand for fuel would have been lower. And as we can see, there is this very sudden increase in rain growth. So this indicates year, uh, a series of years of what we call growth release, which is what happens when uh, with decreased um, light competition in a rootland, species have more access to light and so they grow a, a lot more than they would normally in the normal shade conditions and this happens can happen naturally but such a, a sudden increase is usually connected to management of some type this is what happens with um, coppicing this is a, a coppice stool after after a few years of growth so it produces a number of shoots of roughly the same size, then they are felled, leaving just the stool so that the, the, the tree is not dying. And, and after, another, uh, after a year, another season, then it's sprouting again and it's producing quite fast a new harvest. And this is what happens in, uh, in what, what studies of modern coppices have found. Um, that is the analysis of growth ring in a standard because coppice is sometimes done with standard. So this means trees that are not coppice that are left in the woodland alongside the coppiced ones. And this is what happens in a standard after the coppicing how it takes place. So there is a five to seven year period of growth release with this intense sudden uh, growth release. And then Towards the tail end of the peak metalworking, it seems like uh, their management strategy was no longer able to sustain the needs of the site. To produce one kilogram of finished iron in a bar, so not uh, shaped into any object, it takes about 100 kilograms of charcoal, which can equal 500 to 1,000 kilograms of wood, of fresh wood. So this is with the potentially five or six workshops going at the same time, this is a massive demand on the local woodland, even with the management in place. And you see that for the first time, hazel and alder are no longer the, the dominant species, but betula starts being used. 
and birch wood are present around Inverness, but they're located in the upland zones, so it's more difficult to reach them. Um, they were potentially going further away and to, into more difficult to reach area for their fuel procurement. And interestingly, all this bachelor is also, all these birches also showing um, signs of being under unseasoned. So it's got um, radial cracks that are so developed, it's indicative of the use of wood that has not been allowed time to properly dry. They were probably in a rush to get resources as fast as possible. And the caliber distribution remains pretty much the same. So they're still targeting smaller calibers. And a potential woodland decline is also indicated by the percentage of the um, secondary species used in the assemblage. I've named secondary species everything that is not older and hazel, which are dominant in most of the assemblage. But from the earliest phase of metalworking, where there is very little, less than 10% than secondary species, to here, tail end of metalworking, we are reaching almost half of the assemblage is composed of secondary species. This can be uh, due to woodland decline, so they are no, no longer able to target the species they desired, or it could also be linked to, met, um, to the coppicing because management strategies by creating less shade, uh, less light competition, they promote the growth of understory species that would otherwise not be able to reach maturity in normal wood, unmanaged woodlands. And then in the later metalworking phase, there is a shift back to the use of mainly dry woodland, so oak and hazel, and, and they return to larger sizes. So it's likely that woodland recovered after the end of peak metalworking at the site. So as a conclusion, we've, we've got um, evidence of the use of older and azel at Caldassel as the main species. Uh, the use of species in pretty much the same frequencies as they are present in the, in the surrounding environment. Um, and at, at the Cairns, we, we see that uh, willow was the only species used, plus some uh, driftwood. So they were likely just using uh, the available local uh, resources to them. There was no selection going on as such. Um, this is considered unusual for Scotland because it's often assumed that metalworking in the Iron Age would have employed oak as their preferred source because oak is considered, at least for us uh, in modern days, to be a very good, uh, very good source of fuel. And this is true for the medieval period, and it's true for the Iron Age in some parts of the British Isles. There is some evidence in Ireland of the use of oak for specific uh, activities, but um, there's not really any studies done in, in, uh, in Scotland on metalworking materials. So it, it tends to be, for the Iron Age, it tends to be more of an assumption that seems to not really hold true. Um, so Caldassa also appears to show some switches in the, um, in the use of resources over, over time, possibly related to the overuse of resources or the need for more resources, fast growing species. Um, the use of mainly small and medium sized timbers is indicative of potential management. And this is further supported by the growth pattern showed by single fragments, especially at Caldassa, which also shows uh, how useful it is to do uh, sequential ring uh, ring measurements. And this identification for both sites provide the first real woodland information uh, for the two sites because in the absence of pollen records. And hopefully I've been able to show you that charcoal can make a valuable contribution to the archeological narrative of Iron Age metalworking sites. And if you have any questions, um, you can. <laughs> I think we do have time for questions, yes. Yeah. No questions? Okay. Oh, Raggy first. Um, um this is the um and which uh, species were available in Western, which were in Boston, it's 
boosted would um because that led that opened up a whole big question in my mind about the distribution of the distributions of trees in the countries where this wood comes from to orchids. And I'm not sure if the um, spruce cover is the name out of the same then uh, I didn't know how I think I've learned or read at some point that it, it was a name which is it was more the trees that covered Norway and that the spruce cover that we see now was moved in after the Middle Ages, but I'm not sure about the distribution in the Iron Age. Um so Raggy is making, I, I've been asked to repeat the questions because they don't, uh, they can't hear you in, on the VC. Uh, so uh, Raggy is making a comment about the distribution of, uh, of trees in Scandinavia in the Iron Age. And she's not sure that spruce was uh, covered the same areas as it currently does. But so I didn't look too much into the origin of driftwood also because I don't think doing isotopic analysis um, would be viable in this case, but um, and also that it was not part of the project. Um, but looking at the way the currents go in the uh, in in the North Sea, it's it's more likely that it originates from northern North America. But um, Norway is another possibility, but it's very likely that it came from North America. And Martin had a question. I was just going to ask you about the color that one. Of course, the building is of timber as well, and I like the materials. And so there are these massive timber roundhouse flat work jobs. Mm -hmm. And they have these massive post holes in them, and they recover timber from those. And then, did you say anything about the difference between those timbers and the stuff they're using for the fuel? Okay, so Martin is asking a question about the difference at Caldatho between. Uh, would use for fuel and uh, the, the use for timber for houses because roundhouses had massive postals and so massive timbers. And I think there is a good argument to be made for the selection of oak in construction. I have looked at a couple of the postals for uh, of the posts uh, surviving from Caldasso and they're both oak but there is loads of them. And unfortunately the sampling strategy at Caldasso was quite poor in a lot of ways. So we have very, very limited samples from postals. But in general, uh, similar sites as well. So like Craig Patrick and other site, Balloon Park, which is another commercial site that's very, very close. I think it's like less than two miles from Caldasso. They all have this massive roundhouses and the few postals that have been looked at and or any remains of building material has been oak. So I think there is, yeah, there is a good argument to be made for a select uh, selectivity of taxa in terms of construction and a lot less in terms of, of metalworking. And if they, if they were like, yeah, accounting for the fact that you need a ton, exactly a ton, not just metaphorically a ton of, um, of wood, of fresh wood to make a kilo of iron with the production that was going on at Caldasso, if they were targeting just one species for metal, they would have basically destroyed, the, completely wiped the species off of Inverness in, in just a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the question is uh, whether it's possible that there were multiple types of coppicing going on and that are reflected in the in the record from Caldasso. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> That's a simple question. That it's possible that coppicing in the Iron Age didn't work exactly in the same way as it does today. So they might not have done uh, a formal any formal way of coppicing where like large patches of woodland were coppiced, but just uh, like more selective thinning of certain species in the understory. 
like the curve of hazel in the um, in the growth in the growth pattern of single fragment was a lot less pronounced at older. So it is possible that hazel only saw that kind of growth release because there was selective thinning around it. Um, but there, it's, it is quite fast because willow, older and hazel, they can both be coppiced on short rotation. So five to seven years for, uh, for another, a new harvest to be available. But it's also possible that if they were looking for specific diameters, for example, they were not doing coppicing the way it's done today where the entire stool is felled, but only selection of uh, those rods that have reached the, the right size of their interest, for example, because it's often said that coppicing produces homogeneous size branches, and it kind of does, but there's still, there's still difference in the, in the diameter. So yeah, it, might, it could have been done differently. Yeah. Is that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, um, Rick. 